During this Christmas season, how should we deal with Mary, the mother of Jesus? Should she be worshiped or respected, adored or ignored, magnified or belittled? For a fresh, fascinating, and biblical viewpoint, stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. I am delighted to have in the studio with me today a very special guest and a friend. He is Glenn Meredith, and he is my personal pastor. Glenn is the pastor of the Brookhaven Church in McKinney, Texas, and he has served as the pastor of that church for more than 35 years. I am a person who loves great preaching, and Glenn is one of the most anointed and gifted preachers I have ever encountered. Welcome to Christ in Prophecy, Glenn. Thank you, Brother It's David. always a joy to have you on the program. Those of you who are regular viewers probably recognize Glenn because he has been a guest on this program several times before. And, and most recently, we featured a part of the fascinating presentation he made at our annual Bible conference where he spoke on heavenly rewards. The reason I have him as my special guest today is because of a great sermon he preached a year ago at Christmas time at our church. It was a sermon about Mary, the mother of Jesus. And the reason that I'm so excited about that sermon is because Mary has been so terribly ignored by those of us in the Protestant world of Christianity. This has always bugged me. So when he devoted a whole sermon to her, I just wanted to jump up out of my seat and yell, at long last, hallelujah. <laughs> Glenn, why do you think Mary has been so ignored in the preaching and teaching in the Protestant world? Well, it seems to me that um, those of us who've grown up in, uh, as evangelical Christians and Protestants, that uh, we have seen what we would perceive as the probably the abuse of the overemphasis on Mary by uh, others in uh, uh, Christian denominations. And so I think that uh, too oftentimes we who are Protestants have uh, underemphasized the importance of her. And it's, it's to our detriment because uh, Mary is an uh, incredible woman of God and, and uh, is a person that should be honored, as the Bible says, and give honor to whom honor is due. And, and I think we have failed in that. Well, in fact, uh, she's one of the few people in the Word of God who's referred to as a righteous person. Uh, you know, you, uh, it refers to people like Noah and Job and uh, uh, people like that as being righteous. Cornelius is referred to as a righteous person, even though he was lost and needed a Savior. Yeah. Uh, and, but uh, she's one of the very few who yeah. are referred to in that way. It, it's so interesting, I think, because of our overreaction to what we think is the uh, too high emphasis on her by others. Uh, we miss out on um, what an incredible example she is of a person who's yielded to the Lord, a person who walks by faith and what God can do with a person. And a person who really knew the Word of God. Absolutely. And that's Absolutely. interesting too because most people are not aware of the fact that at the time that she lived, the time of marriage was age 13. As soon as a girl went through puberty, she was considered eligible for marriage. And in fact, you're from Louisiana, <laughs> and I happen to know that among the Cajun French in Louisiana, 50, 60 years ago, that was also an age of marriage. I've, I know several who were married at the age of 13. Wow. And uh, so oh. this is worldwide, in fact. Yeah. Uh, most countries of the world, you find people being married that early. We don't think of that today yeah. in the United States. But she was not some mature woman. She was a young girl at the time all of this took place. And yet such incredible faith yeah. that she demonstrated. Yeah, her amazing response to God. Just uh, an incredible uh, example for us all. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the fact that one of the reasons that the Protestant world has ignored her is because of abuses, uh, theological doctrinal abuses concerning Mary uh, that have characterized both the Catholic faith and also uh, some of the uh, Protestant denominations. And so what I want to do is uh, take a brief break here and come back and discuss some of those uh, erroneous ideas about Mary. <laughs>
Welcome back to our discussion of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and what our attitude should be toward her. Again, my special guest is my personal pastor, Glenn Meredith, who is the pastor of the Brookhaven Church in McKinney, Texas. Glenn, what are some of the misconceptions, perhaps unbiblical conceptions of Mary that uh, have kind of pushed Protestants away from her? Right. Something I did not know was that there is a whole branch of, uh, of theology within the Catholic uh, denomination, for example, religion, that uh, is called Mariology. Yes. And uh, Mariology, the study of Mary. And there are a number of doctrines that they, um, that they believe. And so one of those is the, called the Immaculate Conception. Now, I'll be honest with you, for most of my life in ministry, I would hear that term immaculate conception. And, and I thought, well, I agree with that. I don't have a problem with that. Because I thought that term was referring to Jesus' right. miraculous conception. <laughs> That's right. And, and I thought, well, we agree on that. Jesus was born of a virgin. He was miraculously conceived. And so I thought, well, we agree. Well, when I studied it a little bit, I began to realize, well, no, it wasn't talking about Jesus' conception. The Immaculate Conception Doctrine is talking about Mary That's and right. when Mary was conceived in her mother's womb and that she was conceived according to Catholic theology uh, without original sin, That's right. uh, without a sin nature. And so therefore they believe that she lived literally uh, without the stain of sin as, their, uh, as the terminology used throughout her entire life. So they believe that she was born without a sin nature conceived without a sin nature, that she was born, lived a sinless life. Yes, and, and this, uh, of course, uh, you have to understand, uh, our viewers need to understand that uh, in the Catholic faith, uh, doctrines are not necessarily based upon the Bible. There, there's no biblical evidence Correct. of this, absolutely none whatsoever. Correct. But uh, even Catholics will tell you that their doctrines come from the Bible. They come from uh, the grassroots, like purgatory, is a is a concept that came from the grassroots. It, uh, they they actually admit that over several hundred years, people at the at the grassroots said, well, "There's just no way we can go to heaven unless we suffer for our sins." And so the church finally adopted that uh, doctrine. Can come from church councils. It can come from declarations by the pope, and they don't necessarily have to be biblically based. That's true. And this is one that developed over hundreds of years, and finally, it was not until 1854. That Pope Pius IX made this an official doctrine of the Catholic Church. Now, this was the first step in trying to make Mary really a God, uh, someone equal to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The first step, she was born without any sin nature whatsoever and remained sinless all of her life. Now, that sinless life is very interesting because over in Luke chapter 1, when Mary is, has conceived the Christ child, she goes to visit her, uh, I guess it was her cousin Elizabeth. And as she's there, she sings a song. And this song is very interesting. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 46, Mary sings, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. She needed a Savior. Jerry, I mean, she needed a Savior just like you needed one and Absolutely. I need one. And she was rejoicing that she was giving birth to the Savior. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, uh, for many years, over 20 years, I was on the radio uh, in uh, all over the United States. But we, our, our base, basic station, the one we got the most response from was in Crowley, Louisiana of all places. <laughs> I mean, there's a tremendous number of evangelical Christians who listen huh. to that station. And every Christmas, Glenn, I would do a special program on Mary, and I would talk about how we've ignored her and how important she should be and how she should be a model to teenage girls. And then I'd get to the end, I would say, but you have to understand one thing. Mary was a sinner just like all of us, and she needed a Savior just like all of us. And I tell you what, I got mail knee-deep threatening my life, sending me to the deepest, darkest part of hell, wow. and so forth. Because there were a lot of, of good Catholic people who were listening to this program also. And the very idea that Mary might have been just a normal human being was beyond anybody's conception because she has been built up to be almost a god. That's true. Well, another of the of the ones that I know that, uh, that you... Uh, uh, are concerned about is the, the doctrine that she was a perpetual virgin. How right. about that? Yeah. 
Well, uh, that was also surprised me. Uh, and and uh, but the the belief that Mary was a virgin. Well, we certainly believe the Bible teaches she Absolutely. was a virgin when she yes. conceived the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that with all of our hearts. But the Bible a perpetual teaches virgin. That. But a perpetual virgin. She was a virgin according uh, to Catholic doctrine before uh, uh, the birth, the conception, uh, during the the birth, uh, and then after for the rest of her life. And so, but you look at the scriptures, and and the scripture talks about uh, that. It's the, the last verse in Matthew chapter 1. Uh, it says, and Joseph took her to be his wife, but he did not know her or he did not have sexual relations with her until, until after, after the birth. And so it, it, it specifically says that. And then, of course, uh, brothers and sisters of Jesus are, are mentioned in the scripture. There are five places in the New Testament that say specifically that Jesus had brothers and sisters and even names his brothers, James, Simon, and Jude. Uh, in fact, his brother James became a supreme believer after his resurrection and became the head of the church in Jerusalem. Right. Exactly right. And people argue, well, these were nephews and nieces. Well, look, in the Greek language, there's a word for nephew and there's a word for nieces. These are called brothers and sisters. Right. And so to argue that she was a perpetual virgin is just simply a denial of what the uh, scriptures really right. teach about right. this. Once again, I think just a. Uh, an effort to deify her to make absolutely. Her, yeah. This is all an effort to deify Mary, and that leads us to the next step, and that is the assumption to heaven. What's that yeah, all about? The assumption of heaven. Uh, there's this belief, this doctrine that uh, that Mary was bodily, body and spirit was taken into heaven, and uh, some believe that she may have died, but then her body was resurrected and glorified, and she was taken to heaven. Others. Think maybe without no, that dying. she didn't even die. Yeah, yes. She didn't even die. That and I think it's taken. interesting that again, this developed over hundreds of years, but it was not until 1950 that Pope Pius XI declared that this was to be an official doctrine of the Catholic Church. But he 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 evaded the question of whether she died or not. Right. He simply said that she was assumed into heaven. And I quote as an. Uh, a, a, as, and, and whether or not she was uh, died, he just didn't say. Yeah, he just right. said she was assumed yeah. into heaven. And again, that's very interesting. Uh, I have actually visited the tomb of Mary. It, the tomb of Mary is in a place that people would not suspect yeah. in Ephesus, Ephesus in Turkey. Yeah. Because yeah. when Jesus was hanging on the cross, He committed the care of His mother to the Apostle John. And John, according to church, church tradition, cared for her for the rest of her life. John became the Bishop of Ephesus in Turkey. And that is where she died and her tomb is there. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. So, once again, you know, you look and, and here's there's these comparisons. She's, she's born without uh, sin, yeah. that uh, she is, uh, lives a sinless life, and that uh, now she's just like Jesus, that We're she goes bodily her on the into the same heaven. level as Jesus. Exactly correct. And then another one is that she is the Queen of Heaven. What is yeah. in the world is that? Queen all of Heaven. That she was uh, assumed, caught up into Heaven, and that when she arrived there, that she was given a position. She was given a, a special place in Heaven called the Queen of Heaven. And that as the Queen of Heaven, that uh, she has special mercy and compassion uh, that she pours out on all God's children, and that she, in fact, intercedes for all of God's children. Yes, in fact, uh, at the church of the um, uh, the church at Nazareth, church uh, of the Annunciation, church of the Annunciation, they have this huge mural at the front of the church, and the center point of the mural is Mary. And then Jesus is on one side, and God the Father is in a symbol yeah. on the other side. She's but featured, right? The focus is Mary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's exactly uh, the right. Queen of Heaven. This again was something that this this developed early on. The Council of Ephesus in the fifth century uh, uh, declared her to be the Queen of Heaven, but it was not a declared official doctrine of the Catholic Church until 1954. It's that recent when Pope Pius XI declared this to be an official doctrine of the church. Again, trying to lift Mary up to the point of Godhood. Now, another one is co-redemptrix. Co what is that all about? Well, there's this, this belief that uh, Mary is, um, that, that she's a co-redeemer yeah. with Jesus. Uh, maybe, I think to be fair, I don't, uh, many of them don't believe she's necessarily equal to Him in redeem, redemption, but that she plays a part in our salvation. Yes. And yeah. so there's that, that belief. Now, that is not an official doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church, but many Catholics believe that, and there has been tremendous pressure on the Pope to declare that as an official dogma. And I think he has backed off of that because he knows that there would be no hope whatsoever of trying to 
bring evangelicals back to the mother church as they're trying right. to do now. Right if He were to declare that. Right. And then finally that she is an intercessor for us. And that's, right. a, I mean, that, that's almost blasphemous yeah. because the Bible teaches clearly that Jesus is the one and only intercessor. Right. You know, uh, she's called the, the Mother of God, which uh, if they're referring obviously to that uh, she is the, the Mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, who Himself is of course the eternal God, then uh, we, we wouldn't have a problem with that. But uh, what, what Catholics mean by that in their doctrine is that uh, she's not only the mother of Jesus, they don't think she created Jesus in a sense that way, but that she's the mother of Jesus, but that because we are the body of Christ, therefore she is our mother too. And as our mother, the mother of God, the mother of God's children, that therefore she is the one who protects us and she uh, provides for us. And so, therefore, so many uh, people who are, uh, misunderstand this pray to her and uh, look to her to meet their needs and to protect them and their loved ones and so forth. And Whereas she's the New understand. Testament teaches that Jesus is the one and only, only intercessor That's for exactly us. That's exactly correct. Welcome back to my discussion with Pastor Glenn Meredith about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Glenn, we've taken a look now at some of the improper, unbiblical images of Mary, and I want to shift gears now and turn to the positive, because I know that's what you're just biting at the bit to talk about. And in doing so, I want to get the discussion going by taking a look at a cover of Time Magazine that came out in March of 2005. And on this cover it says, Hail Mary, and it says, Catholics have long revered her, but now Protestants are finding their own reasons to celebrate the mother of Jesus. Well, let's take it from there, and let's just have you point out some reasons why we as Protestants should be putting some emphasis on Mary. Exactly right. Mary is a wonderful example uh, of a person who makes their life available to Jesus Christ, and who's willing to trust His plan for their life. You may have some of your listeners today who are struggling with whether or not uh, they can trust God with their life. They may uh, have a plan for their life. They've got their own dreams, their own uh, direction they want to go, and yet they know God wants them to go in another direction, and yet they're struggling with that. Well, Mary is a, a phenomenal example of, of a person who entrusts themselves to the Lord, and then you see what God did uh, through, uh, his, through her life. And, how and I'd like to emphasize that, what tremendous trust that was, because here's a girl who's probably 13, 14 years old. She is legally married under uh, the uh, Jewish system, whereby she has been betrothed, and that's considered to be legally married, although the marriage is not cons uh, consummated for some nine months of, of a waiting period before she actually uh, has sexual relations with the husband. But here's a young girl, and she is approached by an angel who tells her that she's going to become the mother of the Messiah, yeah. and she's going to become pregnant, and she knows immediately what that means in her society. Exactly. Total disgrace. Right. She could be stoned to death. Right. And yet she says, Here am I, you know, do to me yeah. as you please. Well, you know, she had to be during this betrothal period. She's preparing for that day. Yeah. She goes to live with Joseph yes. and, and uh, she's making her plans as any young bride would do, and she's excited, no doubt, about her future. And, and so she's, she's got this, she thinks her life is all mapped out. I'm going to live here in Nazareth, raise a family, all, all these things that she's no doubt thinking. And then all of a sudden, just uh, the, the angel shows up and everything changes for her. And uh, the angel says, you're, you're going to have uh, the Messiah. And as you said, she suddenly is faced with this decision that, that, that if, if, if I do this, I'm going to lose perhaps Joseph. I'm going to lose my reputation, uh, this, my security for the future. I mean, I, my family may disown me. I could be killed. I mean, all of these things are coming. She's young, as you said. And, but her response is such an amazing response for anybody, much less someone who's 13, 14 years old. Yes, in Luke 1, she says, Behold, the bondslave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. 
Wow. And what a contrast in her response than to what Zacharias had had uh, just a few months before that, six months or so before that, when uh, he responds almost in unbelief. And yet here's this young, young girl who responds in tremendous faith. And I think she's such an example because when she finally says, uh, Lord, you know, be it unto me, your will be done in my life. Then to see how beautifully God then begins to work through her life, to me, is such an encouragement. Mary was a young teenage girl. Uh, obviously, after this encounter with Gabriel, then uh, the Bible says, it leaves out a lot of the details, but it says that she got ready and immediately then she goes to, uh, to check uh, with Elizabeth. because And that's amazing too, because Elizabeth was married to a priest. Yeah. And if, if she had been pregnant as a result of adultery, it would have been his responsibility wow. yeah. to see to it that she yeah. be stoned to death. No, I think, Mary, I, the Bible doesn't say this. I guess I'm using my imagination, maybe uh, hopefully educated guess here. But Mary's a teenage girl. She goes, I, what, to her parents and says, look, the angel appeared to me and I'm going to have a baby and I'm going to, uh, it's going to be the Messiah, the long awaited Messiah. And then she says, but the angel also says that our relative Elizabeth is expecting. Well, they didn't know this. Uh, Elizabeth and she Zacharias, was an older woman. And she lived maybe a, a 90 miles, 100 miles away. And so it says she got ready to go down there and visit them. Well, Mary didn't most likely go by herself. Do you think her parents just said, well, fine, you're a teenage girl, just <laughs> head on down there, walk on down the, the 90 miles, 100 miles away? No. Somehow she got down there, and I don't think she went alone. And so is it possible that her parents went with her, yeah. that they took her? Sure. Now, can you imagine the confirmation? Here's this girl who says, God's spoken to me, and God is, is going to do this with my life. And she took a step of faith and believed God. And she goes down, and you know her parents are, have got to be going, uh, what's going on here? And, uh, and then they walk in the home of Elizabeth, and Mary greets Elizabeth, and the first words out of Elizabeth's mouth is, Who am I that the mother of my Lord would come and visit me? And you can imagine Mary's, the confirmation. It's a, conf a word of knowledge. A word Lord. of knowledge. And, 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 and meanwhile, John the Baptist is doing somersaults in her womb. Just flipping, yeah, for joy. <laughs> Now, who all's with her? I don't know, but let's just assume that her parents are there with her. And they, you know, they've had some question marks in their mind. Is this really happening or whatever? And, and all of a sudden they hear Elizabeth. Number one, she turns around and she's expecting. So the first thing the angel had said, you know, that Elizabeth, well, it's confirmed. And then she says, who am I that the mother of my Lord would come and visit me? And so, so God confirmed, encouraged this young girl. Uh, perhaps made it known then to her support system of her family. So then the Bible says that she stays there with them for three months. So now Elizabeth six months pregnant yes. at this point. So she stays, I would assume, to the birth of John the Baptist. Now, during that three months, of course, uh, Zacharias is walking around the house. He can't talk. <laughs> this whole time he can't talk. He's motioning, he's doing whatever. And so they're, they're witnessing all this. And so Mary is probably there when John the Baptist is born and when Zechariah uh, says, you know, his name will be John and his mouth is opened and she witnesses all of this. And uh, what a, what an encouragement, what a and confirmation. Meanwhile, Joseph is trying to figure out what to do. What to do. And Mary doesn't know what's going to happen when she gets back. How's, you know, she's obviously he knows uh, and he's pondering whether he's going to divorce her quietly. That's he doesn't right. want to make a public example of her. And so, but she's thinking perhaps I've lost him. I've lost my few. Who knows what's going to, she gets back and while she's been gone, the, the angel appears to Joseph and says, do not be afraid to take Mary to your wife, that which is conceived in hers of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, she'll bear a son and you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Everything in this attests to the virginity of, of this young woman. Yeah. First of all, when the angel announced she was going to become pregnant, she said, I haven't known a man. She knew what, how you had a baby. She said, I haven't known. Second thing, she runs to relatives to share the news. How many, un, you know, in that day and time, how many uh, pregnant young girls out of marriage run to relatives to share the good news? Right. And they just right. don't do that. Right. And, uh, it, it, and then, of course, the thing that, that kind of seals it all for me is that the whole story is written by a medical doctor. It's not some That's shepherd true. who is, you know, caught up in myths or superstitions or right. what. It's a medical doctor writing right. this. 
Who knows everything he said he there was is going to know about this. how to have a baby. That's right. And he's saying this is all of a yeah. virgin. Can you imagine what a beautiful, we don't often think about this, this kind of this love story. Here, you know, Mary is going back now and, and when she gets there, then Joseph comes to see her. And, and now her life is hanging in the balance of what Joseph is going to do. And she's sitting there thinking, what is he going to do? Is he going to, you know, have me stoned? Is he going to, uh, you know, divorce me or, or what's he going to do? And then Joseph says to her, you know, the angel appeared to me and said, you're pre- I, I know what you've been telling me is true. And the angel said, call his name Jesus. And she goes, that's what the angel told me to call him. Glenn, the Bible tells us that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God and all of us need to be reconciled to God, our Creator. How about telling our viewers how they can do that? I'd be glad to. Just as the angel said to Joseph uh, that uh, you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The angels uh, appeared to the shepherds and they said, we have great news, good news of great joy. Unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, Christ the Lord, this Savior who will save his people from their sins. And so today, if you would admit that you are a sinner and that you need a Savior, the Bible has declared to us that the only Savior is Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for your sins, was buried in the tomb, rose again from the dead, that you might be saved from your sins. And the Bible says that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you have enough faith today to cry out to Jesus Christ and say, Lord Jesus, save me from my sins, He'll do it. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks for being our guest. It's always a joy to have you. Folks, I hope this program has been a blessing to you, and I hope the Lord willing that you will be back with us again next week. Until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. Were you blessed by the message of this television program? If so, why not share it with others? You can get a copy of our DVD album called Christmas and Bible Prophecy. It contains three programs related to Christmas. The first program in the album concerns the virgin birth and presents solid evidence from the Gospel of Luke for the validity of this basic doctrine of the Christian faith. The second program focuses on the 108 prophecies fulfilled in the life of Christ, including those related to His birth. The third program takes a look at what Dr. Reagan calls the forgotten promises of Christmas. These relate to the promises that Gabriel gave to Mary at the time she was informed that she would be the mother of the Messiah. The running time of all three programs is 75 minutes. This album can be yours for a gift of $20 or more, including the cost of shipping. Just call the number you see on the screen or place your order through our website. These are great programs to show this time of year to your Bible study group, Sunday school class, or your entire church. Christians need to understand the importance of the virgin birth, the fulfillment of prophecy in the Christmas story, and the promises made to Mary that are yet to be fulfilled. Additionally, we will supply you with a complimentary copy of Dr. Reagan's booklets, Are You Ready for the Lord's Return?, and a prophetic manifesto. Just ask for offer number 795. Again, to get a copy of the video album plus the booklets, call the number you see on the screen, or you can place your order at lamblion.com. These items can be yours for a gift of $20 or more, including the cost of shipping. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. 